should be going live in just a minute. Looks like we're recording. Um, so uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the final installment of the SSP 2021 NMT guest speaker series. As always, I am only here to introduce the introducers. So uh, team 10, uh, take it away. Great. Um so Amnahir Pena Alcantara graduated from MIT with a bachelor's degree in material science and engineering. Aiming to create affordable wearable technology for use in healthcare, she's conducted research at the Fibers at MIT lab at MIT, the Rogers Research Group at Northwest Northwestern University, and the Polymers Lab at Oxford University. She's currently a PhD student at Stanford University, where she is also studying material science and engineering. As a high school student, Amna here was interested in biology and chemistry and how they relate to the human body. As a student athlete throughout college, she was fascinated by the structure of the body and by the variety of materials that went into treatments for injuries. These interests led her to getting her degree in material science and engineering at MIT and pursuing the topic in graduate school. Known for exceptional academic achievements, leadership, and civic mindset, she was named the 2019 Knight Hennessy Scholar at MIT. She's also a National Hispanic Recognition Program Scholar and a member of the National Society of Black Engineers and the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. She is also a co-founder of Jabama Blub and has helped high school students explore college and career options by highlighting professionals in a variety of fields. Today, she'll be discussing the future of wearable technology. Without further ado, let's welcome Amnahir Pena Alcantara. Hi, uh, let me share my screen. Uh, thank you so much for that great intro. Um, so I guess just to recap, my name is Amnahir Peñal Cantara and I'm currently a PhD candidate at Stanford University. And I guess today I'll be uh, explaining to you a little bit about how I got here and then some of the work that I've done um, in the meantime. And so to start off with, uh, just want to acknowledge my wonderful, amazing family, as I would definitely not be here without them. So here's my older brother and younger sister, as well as my two parents. Um, we're a very uh, Disney obsessed family. So here we are um, with the castle in the background. And then this is my family, um, at least my dad's side of the family when I graduated college celebrating. So that was very exciting. And then, so to give a little background about where I come from. So uh, I grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Champaign, Illinois, and New York City. And we moved around a little bit for my dad's job, but it was exciting living in like such different places since uh, Champaign, Illinois is definitely nothing like New York City. So that was kind of a culture shock in and of itself, but quite fun. And then these are pictures of me as a kid. So. Even from a young age, I was really excited um, about science. So here's me attempting like a science fair project when I was like really young. And for the longest time, I thought I was gonna be a paleontologist. So this is me posing in front of dinosaur skeletons as I was very excited about that. Um, in middle school, I also got to join the first Lego League tournament. So um, in case you're not aware, that's essentially making robots out of Legos and then programming them to accomplish different tasks. And that was quite exciting. Actually, we got through a lottery system, we got selected to go to the Netherlands for a competition. So I actually got to go international, which was super exciting. And then something that was mentioned in my introduction is that I've always been quite athletic and um, into doing different things with my body. So this picture is me um, as a ballerina when I was younger. I did that for 10 years though. So it was quite a big chunk of my life. Um, and then I went to high school in New York City at Horace Mann. And so 
in high school, my biggest activities were still athletics related. So I was on the dance team, the volleyball team, as well as the swim team. And so that took up a lot of my time, but I think had a huge impact on what I wanted to do in the future because I was like, sadly, constantly getting injured. So I lived in the sports med room and I would see like all of the different things that they would wrap around my knees or on my, or the tape they would put when you had shin splints. And that was always interesting to me. For the longest time, I thought I was going to become a bioengineer to try to make similar artifacts, but over time, my goals changed a little bit. And I want to also highlight that during high school, I also did Science Olympiad and um, took the physics test. So that was quite exciting, as well as taking some of the AP bio, chemistry, physics, and comp sci, which I think gave me a good background for going into college and really being able to excel once I got there. Um, one other thing though, once I graduated high school, I was so excited about going to college. I was ready high key to get out of my house. Um, but I didn't feel quite prepared yet there. Were, I was quite a shy child in high school and I was very scared of going to college. And somehow I convinced myself that moving across the world and living in Beijing for a year would somehow be easier. Um, I don't know why exactly I thought that, but I ended up doing exactly that. So I went to Tsinghua University to learn Mandarin and then conducted research at the McGovern Institute for Brain Science at Peking University. Um, and I guess a fun story to share about my time there. I wanted to dye my, the tips of my hair pink. Sadly, the hairdresser did not understand me, so I dyed my whole head red. Um, that was quite embarrassing because the next day I went to a wedding, which was a traditional Chinese wedding, so I bought a nice red dress so that I could match, but then sadly it meant my whole body was matching. So that was a little embarrassing, but we've moved past it. I've dyed my hair billions of colors since then, and I think going that bold at first definitely helped. And then this is my friends and I, um, hiking and just a nice photo I took with them. And I think the year off, A, it was super helpful because it kind of got me out of my shell. I think it was very interesting going somewhere so far by myself and learning a whole new language and a whole new culture and meeting so many other international students. And I think in the US, it's kind of hard sometimes to take a gap year. It's not as common as in other countries, but I would definitely recommend it because I just grew up so much in that time. And it really prepared me more for college once I got there because I didn't have any of the initial fears of being so far from home. Um, and then that takes me to going to Boston for college. So I attended MIT as I was mentioned before. And there I decided to try something completely new. They had a fencing team that took walk-ons. I had always wondered what it would be like to be like a pirate. Um, turns out fencing is not that, but I joined the team anyways and stayed for four years and ended up becoming squad leader for um, Women's Saber, which is the weapon that I did. And in addition, I also wanted more of a sense of community. And so my sophomore year, I joined number six, which is a co-ed fraternity. And that was amazing. I really learned a lot from everyone who was there and had a great time. Um, and especially like having study sessions and people who could help me out was crucial. And so that was like all of my extracurriculars during college, but the work experience I think is what really helped me figure out what I wanted to do, what I wanted to major in, and essentially if I wanted to go to grad school. So these are all of the different companies, labs, um, and that I worked for during undergrad. It looks like a lot, and I have to say it is a lot. I would not recommend doing this much. Um, at times I was working at two different labs and it was quite difficult to make the time for both of them and my coursework as well. However, this did enable me to really learn what I liked. And so I switched from, I started in more of a biology chemical engineering lab, and that was quite interesting. And then when I realized I had an interest in fashion and um, wearable tech, I joined in the lab that really was making, combining these two together. And then after that, I just hopped along to different labs that enabled me to do this. And so fibers at MIT was, and AFOA both work on advanced fibers. So essentially fibers that go into your clothing that would have technology um, embedded within them. And so that was of great interest to me. As well, I worked with a fashion designer, Ying Gao, 
um, interned at Adidas, which I will go into more about both of these experiences, as well as working in the Rogers Research Group, which is more bioelectronics rather than fashion, but I'll explain that later. But I definitely think, although this tired me out and left me a little sleep deprived, it enabled me to really figure out what I wanted to do in the future. And so that leads me to my last step, which was going across the country to Palo Alto in California to do grad school at Stanford. And I think that was kind of um, a good step, next step for me, because a lot of the research that I wanted to do is it currently being done in many companies. And so going to grad school enables me to work on projects that I want to do and I'm interested in, while also giving me time to figure out if I still want to go into academia in the future or if I want to work at a company and go into industry or if I want to do some more entrepreneurship type next steps. And so um, at Stanford, I work in the Bow Lab. This is the last group photo I have with them, which was pre-pandemic. So I was like a brand new little grad student, very exciting. Uh, we were celebrating some of the visiting students leaving. And as mentioned, I have the Knight Hennessy Fellowship as well as the NSF GRFP Fellowship. And having these two fellowships has really um, been beneficial to me because it enables me to work on research that I'm interested in because my professor isn't the one funding me. But in addition, the Knight Hennessy Fellowship also gives me the opportunity to learn more about entrepreneurship and um, take seminars that I normally wouldn't take, such as taking a negotiation seminar and a writing seminar, which isn't always available at grad school as readily as it is in some other places. And so this has been quite exciting for me. Um, so that's a little bit about who I am, where I came from, how I got to where I am now. And I'll explain a couple more details as I go. Um, but essentially uh, that was a brief intro into who I am. And now I'll go into more about the work that I've done. Oh, sorry, last thing. Another thing I would highly recommend is studying abroad. So I've studied abroad at every opportunity I've had. So in high school, I went to the Bahamas for the island school, which taught me a lot about marine biology. Um, in college, I studied abroad at the University of Oxford. That was very exciting. This is actually the college I went to and I was so excited to live so close to a castle. That was like my dream for so long. So that was fun. And then currently I'm actually in Germany right now. And so I'm doing research abroad at the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart. And so all of these opportunities really have given me a chance to go outside of what I would normally do in all of these different um, locations, such as high school, college, and graduate school, um, while also teaching me life skills. And it's always go to go, good to go out of your comfort zone. So I was really happy I'd had these opportunities. And so to start off with what I do and the work. Um, so normally when you think of wearable tech, the first things that come into mind are kind of the things shown here. So you have your smartwatch, um, a wristband that tells you random information. Some of it's super helpful, some of it not so much. So recently there have been great strides. I've heard um, it can help now um, calling the cops or 911 when you have a heart attack or stuff like that. So this is all super important as well as the smart glasses, which I don't think are as popular as everyone thought they were gonna be. Um, but although this is what everyone thinks of, wearable tech actually encompasses a lot of different things. So all of these different categories fall under wearable technology. And so it is really broad and has a lot of different things that you could be working on. And so, when I started trying to get into this field, I realized that I was most interested in these categories, such as the actual clothes that a person would wear or shoes that someone would wear because they really are in contact with the body and it's something that everyone has. Like we all know how important clothes is to us. It's a way of representing ourselves in the world. And I just think that it would be so interesting to have our clothes not only show who we are, but actually help us in ways that they haven't been able to so far. And so one thing that I emphasize sometimes is saying that I want to work on smart clothing, not wearable tech, because that gives a better idea of like what exactly I would be wanting to work on. 
Um, and so this dress actually, or these two dresses are actually the inspiration um, for why I wanted to go into this. I was a freshman in college, had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, and then I showed up to a, the club's fair, which I would highly recommend all of you do um, when you go to college. And there was a fashion and technology club. So I signed up, went to their first meeting that was in, um, in a shop called Ministry of Supply. And so essentially they made clothes based off of uh, the outfits or uniforms that astronauts wear. And it was essentially just a suit that was like sweat proof, wrinkle proof, all of that, super exciting. And so I decided I wanted to do wearable tech, smart clothing. And I told my parents, they freaked out. They said, how did they send me to a tech school? And I decided I wanted to do fashion. That doesn't make any sense. So I had to make a PowerPoint presentation convincing them this was a real field. And in that process, I looked up many different dresses and versions of wearable tech and smart clothing and came up with this one. So this is the Intimacy 2.0. Um, and so essentially the outfit is black or um, opaque when no worn normally. However, when your heart rate raises and your temperature increases, um, it goes from opaque to clear. And so this was like a very weird dress in my opinion um, of when you're turned on, it would turn clear. And so that would help you and whatever you were hoping to accomplish. There are definitely some issues because your temperature can increase and your heart rate can increase uh, for reasons other than intimacy. But I just thought it was so interesting how your clothes could do something so different from what we would normally imagine and just so creative in its thought process. And so that led me to my first internship in the summer. So I worked at with Ying Gao in Montreal on her dress, Possible Tomorrows. And so this dress was inspired by spirographs. I had never worked with a fashion designer before. All of my previous work experiences had been in labs that were quite technical. And so I was shocked when I showed up and she essentially told us about spirographs, showed us what they were and then said, I want a dress that is inspired by this. I had no idea how you would go from a spirograph to a dress. It did not make sense to me, but thankfully I wasn't the only intern and the other two ones there were actually fashion designers. So we worked together and came up with concepts that we ran by um, Professor Gao and it was quite interesting and so collaborative. And I really learned a lot by working with people who were so outside of my field. And so in the end, they helped with the design and I told them what was and wasn't possible with in terms of mechanical engineering. So I was in charge of motors moving, the 3D printed parts that would really enable this dress to come alive. And so this was the final product. Um, her dresses aren't meant to be worn on a day-to-day -day basis. It's much more artistic. However, this was the final outcome. So there are motors behind the dresses and this really allows the different pieces to move, which I will show in a second. Um, but it was quite interesting seeing how science wasn't enough. I really had to work with the designers. Otherwise it would have looked like a hideous dress if I had been the one in charge of it that probably had nothing to do with spirographs. So that was quite exciting. And I will, um, oh no, where is this? I'm going to try stop sharing and share the video of the dress so that you guys can see it moving. Um, so yeah, these different um, fibers running through move and kind of mimic the shape of the spirograph where you get these neat lines moving through everything. And it's all controlled by motors that are meant to be invisible. So it looks much more like art. Um, yeah, so that was actually such a great opportunity for me to learn about this and learn about the actual art behind wearable tech and smart clothing. So I'll go back to the presentation. So after this internship though, um, I had been thinking this whole time that I would be a mechanical engineer. 
Um, I had signed up to become a material scientist. I essentially did like eeny, meeny, miny, mo because I couldn't decide. And I figured I might as well try something new and decided I was going to take the first classes for material science. And I was really happy I had decided to do that um, because in the end, I realized that mechanical engineering wasn't exactly what I enjoyed. I didn't really like programming the motors and I didn't like making these large scale 3D printed parts. I wanted to be more incorporated into the materials and actually getting the clothing itself to be smart rather than adding stuff to the clothing. And so that led me to Adidas. I was very thankful I was able to get an internship here. It was super exciting. The company is nothing like anything I've worked before. It's the only company I've actually worked for. So that was quite cool. And so this was essentially the inspiration for the 3D printed bra. I don't know if you guys have seen these carbon um, shoes that they came up with, but they were 3D printing the soles with new technology. And they wanted to see how far this, they could take this technology. Um, and since I mentioned I was a material scientist and I was interested in the clothing aspect rather than the shoes, they kind of just let me run wild with trying to make 3D printed bras. And so to go into a little bit of the science, um, we actually had to study breast movement while running and doing exercise. And so we read a lot of papers that will definitely be your life. Uh, if you go into grad school, lit reviews are a huge thing where you just read tons of papers to get ideas, see what's out there, see what's already been done and understand what you might have to change to make your project better. And so essentially what um, the papers we read was tracking the movement of the breast as opposed to the rest of your body to really see how it was moving and where exactly um, it was all coming from. And so you can see here the mismatch between the super sternal notch and the nipple shows how um, your breasts move while wearing a sports bra. There was also data of um, shown when you don't wear a sports bra and what's happening um, they also tried to find a way to represent how the breast movement and by essentially doing a spring and damper system with a mass. And that, we read a lot about the science around that. And we learned that a lot of the pain when you're running for women um, or when you have breasts is uh, associated with the jerking movement of your breast changing directions as opposed to the actual amount of movement that is created while running. And so we really wanted to find a way to dampen the system. And so I wasn't sure if I could show pictures of the final work that we actually did. So I just Googled 3D printed bras. And weirdly enough, a lot of the concepts that we came up with are all on the web. So this isn't exactly what we came up with, but it's a close concept where the cups of the, um, of the sports bra, as well as some of the support, would come from 3D printed pieces. And so this would really help because based off of the structure and how it was designed, it would really allow um, the sports bra to dampen the movement of the breast while running. And so these patterns with triangles, as well as others that can be made with hexagons and stuff, we tested different ones to see how they would dampen the movement. And so it was quite interesting looking at that and seeing what exactly would work for us best. So we really just, tested a lot of different shapes. We tried getting creative and it was super exciting seeing these different pieces um, come to life and really be formed out of nothing. And so I had tried smart clothing. I had done both of those internships that I had mentioned before and I really liked them. I thought I was learning a lot, but as I continued to do research in grad school, I realized that Smart clothing is something that I want to work on in the future, but I want to get the fundamentals first before getting there. And so right now, um, I've been more focusing on bioelectronics. So this is a paper um, with essentially the front cover related to bioelectronics. And bioelectronics are really like skin conforming devices or even within your body that can conform to organs and really give you information such as sensors 
um, about what is happening in your body or on your skin. Uh, a really popular one I saw recently, or a little bit ago, was Gatorade um, had a sen sweat sensor that was for athletes, essentially telling them what was being um, excreted from their body during workouts. And essentially that told them what they should be ingesting after a workout so that they make sure they aren't depleted of any necessary resources. And so I was very grateful to be able to work in Rogers Research Group under the guidance of Professor Rogers. He has been a great mentor to me so far. Um, and while there, I helped um, work on the project about wireless, battery-free, flexible, miniaturized dosimeters that can actually help with solar radiation and phototherapy exposure. And so to give some background, essentially commercial UV sensors that at the time were available were limited by their uses. So they essentially had limited placement locations. So they were either like these watches that I had mentioned originally, which can only be worn on your wrist, or they were large scale things that you had to connect to your clothing. Um, but that also limited exactly where they could go because they were pretty large and you needed thick enough fabrics, all of that. In addition, the ones that could conform to your skin and were able to be placed anywhere had more of a qualitative measurement as opposed to quantitative. So essentially this was a patch that changed color based off of your UV exposure. Um, and this isn't as useful um, if you wanna have an actual number saying how much UV you've been exposed to. And this could be super helpful for can um, recovering cancer patients um, or people who have different conditions that have to limit the amount of sun exposure they have every day. And so what we worked on was essentially making these miniature scaled um, devices that were battery free, that would help with the size as well as their usability. Because if you have a battery, then you would have to charge it. And I don't know about you guys, but every time I try to charge a smartwatch, it ends up forgotten somewhere because I forget to charge it every night or something. So essentially these show you where you can place them, which is essentially anywhere. A lot of the ads for these devices had them on fingernails. It looked quite cute. And they're essentially composed of a supercapacitor that would charge um, as well as a photo detector, which is really what um, is absorbing the UV light. And um, as you absorb more light, the photo detector creates current that charges the supercapacitor. And then when you use the NFC, which is essentially what would connect with your phone antenna, uh, this would allow an app to read how much, uh, how much current um, or voltage was stored in the supercapacitor. And that and it essentially tells you how much UV you've been exposed to. And so this is the whole circuit explaining um, what was happening. And so this allowed for good quantitative measurements of UV exposure and was quite exciting and um, was sold for a while by L'Oreal. Um, the part that I was most excited about working on in this project was actually trying to see how accurate our devices were compared to some other ones. And so the biggest thing with battery, um, with the versions that require battery is that you can't continuously monitor and absorb light because your battery would die almost immediately. And so essentially it would collect data probably every 30 seconds. Um, and so essentially we wanted to create um, uh, shadows that would play up, uh, above these photo detectors and these sensors to essentially see how accurate they were in situations where your arm is swinging, for example, or you're walking in a forest where there are trees and shade. And so it's not always going to be the exact same amount of light that's going into the sensor. And so essentially, we just played around in lab and made weird paper things that moved and tried to make it very rigorous. And so we had stretchers that would move in and out at random intervals. And it was quite interesting seeing how the accuracy when you're only collecting data every 30 seconds decreases substantially compared to that which is continuously collecting data. So you can see the large amount of error that's shown here. Um, and so after that project, I realized that bioelectronics was definitely something I was super interested in. And I had decided I wanted to go into grad school to pursue it further because as I mentioned before, it wasn't 
something that that many companies were working on. And it was something that I felt like I could do really well on in graduate school. And it would give me time to think about what I wanted to do in the future. And so that led me to going to Stanford where I ultimately joined the BOW group um, under the guidance of Professor BOW who also has been a wonderful mentor and a really great advisor to have throughout grad school and throughout the pandemic which has been difficult for many reasons but we're getting through. And so um, in grad school, I'm working on the effect of varying and insulating polymers molecular weight on semiconducting insulating polymer blend morphology. And so this lab is much more chemical engineering focused um, than what I'm used to, but I'm happy that I'm able to use a lot of what I learned in material science for this. And so the current market, um, as I've mentioned, is really interested in these flexible and stretchable devices. So you have these phones that can bend, watches that mold around your wrist. And so there's a lot of interest in that, as well as, as I mentioned, in bioelectronics, so push for stretchable devices that can actually go on your skin and conform and move with your skin. And so with that, there's many different materials that can currently be used um, to fabricate these electronics. And so you can use inorganic materials. This was actually what we used in the previous project that I mentioned. We used very thin amounts of copper. So it's still conductive, but because it's so thin, it's actually flexible. And you can also have different origami type shapes that enable it to become more stretchable as well. In addition, you can have 2D materials. And so these are like graphene, for example, that are also stretchable. Um, and so these are good conductors as well and can be used for these electronics. Um, finally, you have organic conjugated polymers. So these are the materials that I'm actually working on. And so um, I will discuss this in a little more detail on the next slide. And so semiconducting polymers actually have a lot of intrinsic benefits compared to other materials. So they're tunable. Because they're polymers, you can actually exchange a lot of what is seen here. So Z, the Z, which are these atoms on the backbone, can be changed and that'll essentially change the electronic um, cloud in this backbone and that enables you to change the electronic properties as well as you can change the core and the side chains and what's attached and this will change um, the electronic properties ultimately. So there's a lot you can do in these circumstances and that really makes them tunable to whatever use you want it to have. In addition, since they do come as solutions, they are solution processable. So they allow for large scale fabrication. The one shown here is called roll to roll printing. And so essentially you're just printing um, this electronic material onto a roll of tape, for example. And as you can see here, it's flexible um, and you can see it blowing in the wind. In addition, they're conformable. So this is always a cute picture in my opinion. They essentially made a pressure sensor that can go on your skin and it can essentially tell you exactly where the legs of these ladybugs are. And so you can see that your hand definitely moves around and has a lot of wrinkles in it. And so being able to conform to your skin shows how these materials can actually conform to different materials well and have good mechanical properties for this. And finally, they can also be stretchable. So as you can see here, this is an OLED that is stretching while still being able to light up. So that's quite exciting and shows a lot of the benefits that conjugated polymers have compared to other um, materials that I had listed before. And so I wanna go into some of their uses as well. So they can be used as biosensors. In this example, this is a cortisol sweat sensor. They can also be used as pressure sensors, as I mentioned before. They can also be used as transparent solar cells. I know that this is a large area of interest now because essentially you can coat them on windows and gain energy from the light passing through windows without actually having any tint. So no one would really notice that you are doing so much in one tiny window. And finally, they can also be used as transistors, which is actually the part that I test. So transistors are fundamental building blocks for electronic devices. And so essentially these are crucial for being able to have more complicated electronics in the future made out of these materials. And so I really focus on how we can use these transistors to test the electronic properties within our devices. 
while also knowing that it can have a use in the future. And so to just give a little background about the project that I'm currently working on, there's currently a lot of conflicting requirements for their uses. As I mentioned, you want them to be stretchable and flexible. However, one of the main requirements to end up getting good charge transport within our films is that they have to have these crystalline regions, um, which are shown here in the darker pink. And so these really allow for charge to move between the different um, polymer chains, while in the amorphous region, these kinks and bends really limit that movement. So you need to have good crystallinity. However, um, crystallinity is really in opposition um, of when you want stretchable films. And so you really want more amorphous regions to have good stretchability because as you can see, these bent regions can stretch out and really align, enabling you to have more stretchability. And so this is actually a huge challenge that's being faced within our, um, in a, within our field. And so how can we create stretchable films with good charge transport? And so one of the ways that it has been done before, um, previously in my lab, and I essentially work off of a derivative of this, is by blending the conjugated polymer, in this case, a DPP-based polymer, with an insulating polymer. And so the insulating polymer essentially uh, is an elastomer, and so it can be easily stretched and is very flexible. And so when you blend them together or mix them together, you actually promote stretchability. So in this neat film, which essentially means when you just have the conjugated polymer, you can see that as you stretch the device or strain it, the mobility, which is a metric of charge transport. So the higher the mobility, the better the charge transport decreases. And so this shows you that the device isn't actually stretchable because you can't stretch it and maintain the same performance. However, when you blend the two films together, you can see that the mobility remains constant. And so you can really create stretchable devices that can also be used for electronics. And so this is quite exciting and I work on doing more of this. And so in conclusion, um, just to describe the different projects that I spoke about, I worked on creating a moving dress with Professor uh, Gao. And so this really was my first chance and first opportunity to work on smart clothing. And it was super exciting working on the motors and the fibers and everything. And from there, I realized I wanted to work on more fun fundamental material science. And when I worked at Adidas, I was really able to do that by working on 3D printed sports bras and really studying the science behind what you need in a sports bra and um, how you can actually help. And this internship ultimately led me to make another pivot into bioelectronics. And so there I worked in Professor Rogers' group on UV sensors. And finally in grad school in Professor Bao's group, I work on transistors and trying to make these stretchable films. And so all of this shows that you'll slowly adapt and change what you're interested in. I'm definitely interested in going back to smart clothing at some point, but I'm loving where I am now and hoping to continue to do so for a bit. So thank you so much. And I'm open to any questions if there are some. Uh, yes, we have some questions that they were, well, there was a petition to be asked at the end because there were no clearly related to a specific uh, uh, yeah, slide. So the first one is, does your field of work also include deciding how to produce or market these products to be more available? If so, how, may, how have you done this? If not, who does? Yeah, so essentially the marketing of these products and how to make them more available isn't exactly done by us. I know it can be, so um, I can go back. When I worked with, uh, in Professor Zhao's lab at MIT, uh, I was actually helping them more on the entrepreneurship side. And so it was really learning more about how you can market them, um, what exactly you need to get a patent, once you have a patent, how you can sell the rights and licensing so that ultimately these products can be used. Um, and so I think a lot of the patent work does end up happening by the scientists since they are the ones that created it. However, from there on, um, it can go different routes. So I know someone in my lab um, in grad school works on uh, flexible and stretchable batteries. And so 
he created a great product and is now doing the entrepreneurship route. And so he currently has a company that he's working on for selling these and manufacturing. However, at the same time, I know that other work people have created this patent and ultimately just licensed it, licensed it to companies that can ultimately use them. Uh, so we have another question that says, uh, wait, it's moving. How did you go about finding a research program during your gap year before college? Oh, a research program? Yeah, so I think finding a research lab, I guess it wasn't a program, I reached out to specific labs, is quite difficult, um, especially from high school. I was very uh, thankful because I'd had research experiences in high school during the summers. I worked um, at Columbia University. Um, and so this enabled me to essentially you learn how to reach out to professors themselves. Um, uh, and so essentially it was a lot of emailing professors and seeing if they would have space for a student and sending a cover letter and a resume and essentially explaining what I was doing um, to see if they would accept me into their lab. And in the end, one of them did. Um, it's always difficult, networking is helpful. So I definitely wouldn't have gotten this if I hadn't had previous experiences, which is definitely true for those um, experiences I had at MIT. So a camp like this where you meet professors um, or guest speakers is always help to reach out to them and see if they know anyone who might take you. And I think that's a good way of going about it. Well, our next question was, do you ever feel pressured to follow just one field rather than branching out in your field of interest? Uh, I would say I definitely don't feel that pressure. Uh, my dad would say I should feel it a lot more than I do. Um, I think I really took, well, you know, I, I mean, I don't know what you guys see on TV, but when I was growing up, I always saw college as this great chance to explore and find out who you were. And I took that to heart. So essentially all of these different internships and research uh, opportunities were because of the fact that I would try something, realize it wasn't exactly what I wanted or it was close, but not quite. And then I would say like, okay, let me try something else that's related. Um, and definitely think that that was good because it really allowed me to learn what I wanted to do. Like for example, it's not listed here, but the very first research experience I had at MIT was in a nuclear engineering lab. They were taking students and I thought, why not? I'd never heard of, well, I've never seen nuclear engineering be done before. Um, I realized it wasn't for me and then I quickly switched. And so I think that's always a good way to go about it. I know if you are interested in graduate school though, I have been told that it's better to stick to one lab for at least two years. Um, so I tried to do that towards the end, but I think for sure you should try to explore in the first year or two of undergrad because that's really how you're going to figure out what you like and what exactly the day-to-day -day work is because big pictures and ideas are fun, but it's not really that exciting when you're in lab doing the same thing 20 million times. You have to see if you actually enjoy doing that. The next question is, what do you think is the future of wearable technology? Oof, that's a big one. I'm not exactly sure, to be honest. I think there has been more of a push recently to go into the smart clothing route and also the bioelectronics. So I know uh, Google a couple of years ago was working on a jacket with Levi's that essentially is like instead of having to touch your phone to change music or something, you could use the jacket. Um, but Endofoa, um, this company that I work for, was actually working on some really cool stuff and using wearable tech for safety reasons. So they were essentially trying to see how you could better light up a person through their clothes with their LED fibers. And I think that's super exciting. I personally am interested in trying to see how this can be used for environmental purposes. So uh, in the future, I wanna see maybe if there's a way to combine this and make clothing that works as air filters or something like that, which will enable us to walk around look cool while also helping the environment. So the next question is, how do you typically synthesize the materials for stretchable devices, i.e. the LED, or do companies often sell them now? 
which or I guess they're written. Never mind. Um, uh, I guess a lot of the materials are like the basic building blocks are bought from companies for the most part. I would say. Um, let me go to the last slide. So I would say, except for where I'm working at right now, everything was bought from a company. Um, some of it was much more specific. So for the 3D printed sports bra, there was a partnership with Carbon. So we specifically were using what they were giving us and what was available through them. However, for these two internships, uh, I would go online and see what was available. I had shown up pretty late for this project. So a lot of the manufacturing and design um, or all of it was done already, but that was also um, bought from companies. However, with the transistors and the polymers that I'm working with now, we do purchase them, but they have to be specially made sometimes. And I'm not into the chemistry, but some of my friends in lab are. So if there's something specific I want, or if they're trying something new, they'll actually completely fabricate them uh, or synthesize it themselves. So they are creating new polymers as we're in lab. And then I work more on the testing of the device and looking at its morphology to see how effective they would be. I hope that answered the question. If not, I maybe ask a different way, sorry. <laughs> um, the next question is, do you have any advice for students who are interested in several fields and want to combine them in their research or career? Yeah, I definitely have advice for that. So I think, um, I mean, I don't know how much you guys have looked into colleges yet. Um, slash the research labs and colleges, since that's kind of specific. But a lot of these labs, a lot of labs now are super interdisciplinary. And so it's hard in high school to see how things combine, because at least for me, a lot of it was split up very discreetly. So there was biology, chemistry, physics, and they seem like completely different things that you couldn't combine. But as I moved through undergrad and now graduate school, I see that almost all professors are combining a bunch of different things. And so you have to, it's quite difficult. There's a lot of Googling involved, but you essentially have to just check and start by like, okay, I'm kind of interested in these things, Google them, look at labs that are doing that, and then see if they also have some of the other stuff that you're interested in. And ultimately you can find some that will have much of those different topics that you're interested in. Um, another advice is if there's a class you really liked, or you like in undergrad, you can always talk to that professor and see if they have people they would recommend you working for during the summer or something like that. But I think you should definitely not try to limit yourself. Uh, there's almost always a chance you'll find someone, at least one person who's working on all the things you enjoy. Um, so I think that it's very possible you just have to put in the effort to find it. Um, and yeah, as I said, I've changed slowly what I'm interested in as I go through these projects because it took time to finally find someone who does all of the things that I'm interested in. Great, the next question is, is exposure to radiation from technology a concern for long-term use of certain wearable technology? Oh, that is a good question, which I don't think I have the answer to. I would say probably not if we walk around with our phones in our pockets 24 seven, which I assume we all do. Uh, your clothing isn't going to create much more radiation. Um, in addition, a lot of safety precautions have to be had with um, new technology and all of that. And so I think this is probably not a very big worry for sure, which is good. But I don't know 100%. And it obviously depends on who's designing the clothing and who's making the technology. What's the budget like for creating products in this field? If you had an infinite budget, what would you make? Oh, okay. So the budget is a difficult question um, because the budget's going to vary a lot depending on where you're working. Um, so in labs at university, they have to apply for grants and that gives them funding and that's where the budget comes from. And so it really just depends on what exactly your professor is working on and what grants they end up being granted. It can range from quite small to quite large. So I'm very thankful that the last two labs I worked for have very large um, grants that we're able to work with. And so 
so far money hasn't been a huge issue with the things that I'm working on as well as like all like not a lot of this is quite expensive when you're trying to manufacture these. Um, I would say if I had an infinite budget, I think one of the things I mentioned the air filter, that would be super exciting. One of my biggest dreams in life, which is going to sound a little silly, but I really want air conditioning clothing. I don't know where you guys are from, but I just get so hot in the summer. Like I'm very much someone who comes from cold places. And so having clothing that can really air condition yourself um, as you're just walking through your day would create just make my life a lot better. But if you also look at it if from an environmental standpoint, a lot of energy is wasted cooling buildings with AC and things like that. And so not having to do that where everyone can keep their own temperature regulated would decrease the pollution created um, in the world very intensely. But I think that's gonna cost a lot of money to create because I know some uh, companies are currently working on it and we're, in, we're not there yet. So hopefully soon, if not, I got you guys, if this is something you're interested in. <laughs> um, how does 3D printed clothing, such as your work with Adidas, compare to current clothing in terms of sustainability and impact on the environment? Yeah, so 3D printing actually is like a super exciting field because it's known for being more sustainable actually than a lot of um, current uh, fashion uh, houses are because there's a lot of waste with extra fabric that's created um, as well as like a lot of waste is created even after you've made the clothing and sold it such as t-shirts. Imagine how many shirts you've owned throughout your life that you don't currently still use or own. Um, versus 3D printing is known uh, to have none of that waste. So essentially, uh, depending on how you're doing the 3D printing, but you can essentially recycle the materials that aren't used as well as since you're making it specifically tailored um, to the design you want, it, you're not gonna have extra production or anything like that. And so that really makes it much more sustainable. Um, I am not super proficient on that because I haven't done it in a while, but there is a new professor at Stanford called Professor Joe DeSimone who works on that and really talks about the zero waste cycle of uh, 3D printing, um, which is super interesting, as well as I've, I've seen something of interest now is being able to custom make your clothing. So essentially you wouldn't buy everything from a company, but instead, or you would buy it from a company, but it wouldn't be like generic, small, medium, large, you could have it tailored to yourself. And so that would also limit the fact that some people do go to tailors after the fact to make clothing and things like that. Okay, the next question is what advice, professional or personal, would you give to your younger self? Ooh. Oh my gosh, these questions are all so intense. Um, okay, I think advice I would give. Um, I think one thing that I should have learned earlier is being able to find the opportunities that are available. I think um, there was a lot of stuff that I could have done during uh, college and in grad school that I didn't learn about until later. And so I've slowly gotten better at being able to search what's available and talk to the people around me. But I think one thing I could have done more of is, yeah, talking to upperclassmen and seeing like what everyone has tried, how it works, um, what's available. Like MIT has a lot of programs um, that'll enable you to go abroad each summer and they help you get internships. And I know other schools have similar things. And so really looking into that would have helped me both professionally and personally because I love to travel. Um, and I think one other thing that is always helpful is to really think about what I want to do and what I prioritize. So I think I've been happy that I almost always put a good priority onto athletics because I think working out is fun and it gives me time to think about something that isn't school uh, at least once a day. Um, but it's been harder during COVID and grad school. So I think making sure that I always put in that effort to think consciously about what makes me happy um, is really important for someone to do. So looking back, what do you think was your most important learning experience? Mm. 
Um, I think looking back from the projects that I described, I think the 3D printed sports bra would have had the biggest learnings for me. I had never worked at a company before, so that was a whole new process of learning what industry was like, which was super exciting. Um, but in addition, they kind of just threw me into this project. There weren't that many people working on it. It was a lot of like running around, meeting other people, trying to get more confident with myself and my knowledge to actually speak to these people and feel like I deserve to be heard as I was like a sophomore in college and these were all adults who'd been working there for five, 10 years. Um, and I think that really helped me realize that sometimes if you read enough papers and learn enough that you should be confident in what you know and that will allow you to work better with others because there won't be some of this tension of like no one knows what's up and I kind of have a sense but I'm scared to speak about it while also always acknowledging that those who have worked in the other fields for longer will provide some critical in feedback into what I'm doing and so I think that was definitely a hard time but also really rewarding in the end and that enabled me to go into these other internships much more effectively. Um, how do you go about making smart clothing more comfortable for people to wear? And what's the process of finding the right mix of fabric and technology? Yeah, so actually I have thoughts on that. Um, I think that I believe that what I've seen so far hasn't gotten there yet. And I think that's why I'm so interested in working on this project. Like I've seen a lot of progress be made because as I said, when I was making that PowerPoint freshman year to convince my parents, this was a real field. A lot of the uh, smart clothing that was available really was like put an Arduino onto a piece of clothing and then have it do things, which I think is comfortable except for where the Arduino is because it's large and bulky. And I remember always having those light up t-shirts when I was a kid, I got really excited by them, but they would also have like these battery packs that were kind of annoying. And so I think as we move forward with technology, um, we're gonna get to a point where the fabric actually is the technology. And so that's what I'm hoping to do, where it's not two separate things, but actually one thing. And so that's what AFOA currently works on, where the fibers themselves are the technology, but also the fibers you work in the clothing. Um, and that's also why some labs and people are skipping over the fabric and just going straight to bioelectronics because these go directly onto your skin, but it would feel like uh, essentially like one of those fake tattoos. I don't know if you had when you're kids that you put water and just stick it on your skin, you wouldn't really feel it. Um, and so ideally there would be no difference between what you're wearing now and what you would be wearing in the future with smart clothing. But I think there's a long way to go before we get there, which is kind of sad, but also very exciting for a scientist and engineer. <laughs> Okay, the next question is, how do other study fields and business affect your job? And how do you convince people who don't see the point of a smart clothing that it's worth the resources? What was the first part of the question? The ah, how, do you, how do other study fields and businesses affect your job? Hmm. So I think for now, I don't know exactly how to answer that since I'm in graduate school. Um, we kind of work on stuff that's before it would even get to other businesses and companies. Um, so if you think about it on a timeline, companies tend to be more on like a max three years in the future basis, unless they have R&D, which is essentially like your research lab in a company that goes five to 10 years out. And labs sometimes think like 30 years out in the future. And so um, thankfully in my field, this hasn't been too much of an issue. I know Professor Rogers actually has uh, done great work where the research and the technology he builds has actually been used almost immediately. So these devices were sold as well as he has, uh, he helped with the Gatorade sensor patch that I've mentioned before. And I think right now, a lot of it is collaborative in terms of companies and labs. Um, so essentially, a lot of businesses will pay research labs or grant funds so that we can work on the technology that will be 30 years in the future and they'll kind of have the rights to it, I think is how it works. Um, so that's kind of uh, the way I've currently been looking at it. I'm not sure if I was currently working in industry at a company, how the competition is between them. So I don't think I should 
speak on that. But sorry, what was the second part of the question? Yes, the second part was, wait one second. Uh, how do you convince people who don't see the point of smart clothing that it's worth the resources? Yeah, that's a, an interesting one as well. I think it's quite difficult because a lot of people kind of have their own worries and stresses, such as like the radiation question that's very common, as well as other things related to having technology on you at all times. Um, in addition, as I mentioned before, some people think why even bother putting it on clothing and not just sticking it on your skin itself. And so I think that really comes down to speaking with the person you're having this conversation with and really explaining your project fully and why it's important. And I think one of the things that I strongly believe in is that clothing is never going to be obsolete. I think we've had clothing for as long as there have been people. Um, and so I think it's really crucial to see how we can use something that's always been necessary for cultures and um, different styles of expression to really use that and optimize it and bringing it to a new level. And so I think that's why I'm so interested in it. And then convincing others really requires you to have the exact project. So as I mentioned with the air filters and the air conditioning clothing, I think I've done a lot of research into why this would be sustainable, how exactly this would help the environment, how it's possible to do it. And I think for every project, you kind of have to go about it um, in that way. And I also think some people choose not to do that. So I know Professor Gao, she's not interested in making clothing for every day. She really sees fashion as art. And so I think that's also something that's of interest and people should do what they're most interested in and see how they can get funding for that. Our next question is, what is your biggest regret? Oh, man, I feel like I'm at an interview now. Um, <laughs> my biggest regret. I think, as I mentioned before, I really appreciate everything I learned from all of my different internships and research experiences in undergrad, but I think I definitely could have used more focus. So I think I should have done only one at a time and really put in a lot of energy and effort into that. And also something that you guys will all face is learning time management is super difficult and you get into undergrad and you think you can handle a certain amount of stuff outside of class time. And I think you slowly learn how to get better at reading what time you will have, but there's always gonna be surprises. And I think my biggest regret was one time I had like two internships at the same time and it was like sophomore year, which is like our hardest year ever. And we had like a ton of tests and I like never told my internship advisors or like the grad students I was working in ahead of time that I was gonna be stressed with a hell week where I had like three tests in one week. And then that caused issues later on where I would just like be, do be doing too much and too stressed, lots of tears were shed. And I don't think I needed to live through those experiences at all. So I think, learning time management is definitely something I should have done earlier. <laughs> uh, who are your instrument, who are your inspirations in the fields of fashion and science respectively? Oh yeah, so um, I, yeah, I'm actually super lucky. So Professor Bao and Professor Rogers are actually uh, kind of my inspirations in the field in science. They're like super uh, cutting edge with a lot of the research that's done. And so I'm super excited that I'm a I was able and am able to work with them as well as being mentored by them because I think I learn a lot by reading the papers that come out of both of these labs and talking to many of the people that were in these labs. Um, in terms of fashion, uh, I think that Professor Ying Gao was obviously inspirational. There's also another designer who works on wearable tech, um, Pauline Van Dogen. And she does really cool stuff with solar cells and they look gorgeous. Like they look like really pretty clothing. And so I think that um, those are kind of my inspirations for who I look for. But I think it's also cool just seeing like what clothing people are wearing. So a lot of the stuff I like is just a lot. I'm from New York. So everyone dresses very interestingly and different. And so I don't always know who makes the clothes, but it's nice seeing what's around and what people are wearing. Perfect. Uh, it seems that the next question is, in the future, what kinds of projects do you ambition yourself being involved in? Projects. Um, 
Yeah, I think I am not totally sure. I would say that I've been kind of putting off this. So I have three more years in grad school, so I'm focusing on the research at hand. However, I am really interested in going back and working more on fiber work and seeing how we can really make these more advanced fibers and see what you can actually do in them to, with, to make mm, smart clothing. Um, and so I think that's something of great interest with me. And I also want to see how I can combine this um, with my interest in having more environmental sustainability, since I think that's going to be a crucial problem um, in the future. But what exactly the project is, I'm not sure yet. Um, we'll see as, as I continue going, my ideas morph. And so that's kind of an exciting thing that I'm able to do. Our next question is, can you elaborate more on the batteryless wearable technology slash sensors and how they function? Yeah, so I can actually go over, I guess, the one that I showed here. Um, so essentially, um, in this case, you have copper um, and then a polymer thin film layer and then another copper layer. And so the copper actually creates the antenna um, that allows you to communicate with your phone. And then it also creates the circuitry for the um, device itself. And so essentially in this device, what you have is this photo detector shown here. And so that essentially has um, a wavelength of light that it picks up on. So for example, you could use it for UVA light. And so essentially uh, when that light hits the photo detector, um, the light is converted into electricity. And so it becomes current. And the current then charges the supercapacitor, which is shown here. And so essentially, as more light hits the photo detector, you're going to have more current running through to the supercapacitor. And that essentially builds a voltage within this, um, within this like uh, piece within the um, device. And so ultimately, then you have this NFC, which enables you to connect with the phone with the antenna. And through the app on the phone, you can essentially like hit the button that says like read tell me my reading and so it will essentially convert the voltage on the supercapacitor to the um the amount of light that you've seen so this is continuously monitoring because there's no way to turn off the photo detector but you do need to check um into the app every once in a while because ultimately the supercapacitor can only hold so much um, charge and voltage and have such high voltage before it starts leading to leakage current. And then uh, lastly, you have this MOSFET, which essentially enables you to reset the device. So it completely um, discharges the supercapacitor so that you're able to get more light coming in without reaching these large levels that have large leakage currents and then lead to inaccurate results. And so this is essentially how this one works without needing a battery within it. Um, and our next question is, what's, what is a good balance of sustainability and art and wearable tech? Would you rather have sustainable clothing that may not look aesthetic or vice versa? Yeah, I think I mean, as a scientist, I would say I would prefer having sustainable clothing over appearances, but I know that's like unreasonable, right? No one's gonna buy ugly clothing just because it's good. Um, and so um, I also think there's no reason you should have one over the other. What I learned really well when I was working with Professor uh, Ying Gao is that you can really work closely with the fashion designers to make sustainable and attractive or pretty clothing because um, if the technology is really within the fabrics themselves, um, you there's no limitations on what the clothing would look like, right? You could cut it up however you want and still have the same functionality and whatever style you want. And then when it comes to what patterns there would be on the fabric, I think it's very reasonable that you would be able to find a solution to that. So ultimately you would get the clothing you would want and clothing that would look like those that we have now. And I know when I worked at a FOA, that was a big thing. They were making clothing with these fibers, um, but obviously they were working with a company that made um, these pieces of clothing. And so it still looked like everything normal, except every fifth fiber, for example, would be light up um, with LEDs. And so I think there was really no limitations. It's really more comfort and trying to get to make sure you know what you're prioritizing and comfort 
and uh, sustainability should be high on the scientist list and the designer should have appearance high on their list and you can work together to really get both working closely. Perfect, thank you. And it seems that this is our last question and it is, is the future of diversity in smart clothing similar to the future of diversity in AI? And how can wearable tech be made more considerate of the diverse identities? Um, I'm not sure I know about the diversity in AI. So I don't know if whoever asked that question wants to speak up. Uh, if not, uh, I can just answer. Okay, so I guess I'll just answer. Um, well, I think diversity is super important. Um, as an underrepresented minority um, and also female, it's been hard sometimes being the only one who looks like me or one of the few females that's working in a lab. Um, and that can get kind of daunting. Um, and it's also difficult because I think diversity is crucial for having good ideas and actually taking science steps further, right? Because you need to know what challenges people are facing and you don't really know that if everyone in the room is the same. Um, and so I think in smart clothing, the same things would apply, but even more so, right? Because clothing, as I've said, is something that's so linked to our culture and an expression of who we are. And I think that if you don't have people there showing and explaining like what is okay, what you can wear, what you would want to wear, you might run into many issues. And I think um, that's true for both the science side and the fashion side, because the science itself is also crucial because you wanna make this comfortable and sustainable, but you also need to know like what people are actually gonna want their clothing to do, what they'll feel safe with it doing. Um, for example, one of the projects I had worked on was putting like, um, fungi onto a mask that you would wear and that was like super cool but it was clear that was more on the artsy side and it wasn't really going to be applied it wasn't something people were going to be wearing every day at least at that point and so I think having diversity of people who think like okay that's really cool how can we like turn what we've learned from this into something else is crucial um and yeah I mean graduate school now and the diversity is quite lacking and so we've made a lot of committees and are trying to work on increasing the diversity because I think I have learned so much from working with so many different people and like right now a lot of the diversity comes from me being a material scientist and someone being an electrical engineer or mechanical engineer um, but in the future I would love it to be more diverse than even that and working with more designers um, or just people of different cultural backgrounds from different countries um, and I think that's crucial and I know um, my oh, and so I was really thankful my frat um, was like quite international. So there was people from like all over the world. I think like we only had like four Americans and then there were a bunch of Bulgarians and people from all over the place. And I think it was quite exciting that that also enabled me to have more ideas and think more about what I was doing. Um, and so I think this is definitely something that people are thinking about and hopefully will continue to improve um, in the future. And I hope so in AI as well, but I, I don't know. <laughs> All right, and uh, with that, um, I would like to be able to thank uh, Ms. Peña Alcantara, I hope I said that correctly, um, for her time and her presentation on, uh, on her clothing and everything that she's done within her uh, career so far as a as a student as well as a grad student. So, um, if everyone could please uh, unmute and thank our guest lecturer, that would be great. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you.